Yeah, yeah. FaceTime you works on the Wi-Fi. It's good? It's good to go? All righty. Yeah, they know how to cut it. Okay, cool. Is, is this the camera that's on, by the way? They're more with the red light? Oh, okay. Oh, he can switch them up there. Well, that's neat. Okay, cool. Okay, thank you, Rylan. <laughs> Okay. Well, hey, everybody. Hey, welcome back. Welcome to our Christmas week here in HFS. I hope you guys, uh, if you haven't already, you're going to get some amazing beanies uh, or toboggans, whatever you want to call them, with the custom HFS logo. If you don't know me, my name is James. I'm the youth pastor from the Bristol campus, uh, and we'll be doing this for a few uh, weeks or a little bit. Uh, Marion, you guys are going to your own campus soon. That is incredible. So excited for you guys. Abingdon, welcome, ble- welcome back. Bluefield, welcome back. Hey, today's message is the Christmas message, and it's a great one. Uh, You guys have decided to come to service to hear. I'm so excited uh, to give it to you guys, and this week we're talking about where do you put Jesus? So uh, I'm going to start off real quick by reading the scripture, and then we'll go into, I'm going to tell a little bit of a story about myself when I used to ding-dong ditch when I was in high school. Hopefully some of you guys can relate to that or have done that. Hopefully, you know, some of you guys have not done that, but I would expect uh, a portion of you have. But we're starting in Matthew chapter 2. And we're going to read verse 1 through uh, 12 right here. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during this time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? If you don't know who Herod is, by the way, he's the king, uh, or like, kind of like the ruler uh, of this area. And so they're asking, hey, where is the king uh, of the Jews? And he, like, he's got to be thinking, I'm the king of the Jews. I'm the ruler of this area. What do you mean? Uh, and, he's, and he says, or the Magi are saying this, we saw a star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chiefs, priests, and teachers of the law, he asked them where the, where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of, Ju- of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of, Ju- of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people for Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out uh, from them the exact star that had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. He, in that moment, he's not actually thinking he's going to go worship him. He, he's picturing more of a threat when he hears about a king being born, but he's trying to, he's trying to trick these people. Uh, and after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them uh, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And, ha- and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country in a different route. So instead of going straight back to Herod like they've been instructed to by him, they went a different route to tell him, hey, this is where the kid is, this is where the baby's been born, so Herod would know where it is. But they had a dream uh, from God, and it says, hey, don't go back and tell him. Herod views it as a threat. And because they did this, and Herod finds out about this, Herod, in his mind, uh, and whenever you get scared, rational things don't happen in your mind, Herod, in this moment, actually decides to kill all of the baby boys two years and under because he's so scared. And I don't know if you guys have ever been terrified in a moment. Uh, This is where the story of ding-dong ditching comes in. When I was in high school, I went over to my buddy's house. It was like freshman year, so we all just started playing football, and we're hanging out, and of course, you know, late at night, like high school guys or girls do, uh, we decided it's a great idea to go ding-dong ditching. If you don't know what ding-dong ditching is, it's where you go ring someone's doorbell and run away or hide in the bushes really quick. They come out, they get upset or something, and, and that's the whole, <laughs> that's the whole, you know, hoorah. Well, this night, we were going, and we were like, we were just walking down the street, and it was like 1 a.m. or something, but we were just walking down the street, and we're walking past this guy, like everyone, I don't feel like maybe everyone's neighborhood or apartment complex has like, you know, that one cranky older person. 
Well, this neighborhood definitely had one, and he sees us walking down the street at 1 a.m., and he slams his window, he's going, bam, and he starts yelling at us, what are you doing on the street? Well, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna call the police, all this stuff. So, so we run off back to my buddy's house, and we're sitting there for a little bit, and we were like, well, we weren't even doing anything. We, we were just walking on the street. And so, of course, in our, in our high school minds, we think it's rational to go, and he lived at the bottom of this hill, and halfway down, there was a gravel driveway, and this guy had a tin roof. If you know anything about tin roofs, like when it rains, it's really loud. And so we're like, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go pick up these little rocks and we're gonna throw them high in the air and they're gonna come down and go bam and, and hit his roof. He's gonna wake up, get mad, all this stuff. So we do it one time, so whoo, you know, bam, hits the roof. Uh, he slams open the window and he's I know it's you kids, I'm calling the police, all this stuff. So we do it one time, nothing ever happens. We wait like 30 minutes or an hour. We go back, we're like, hey, this is gonna be even funnier. We're gonna do it, he's gonna get even more mad. He's gonna come outside or something. So, you, know, you know, throw the rock, woo, bam, hits the roof, slams open the window again, gets mad. So uh, after we do it the second time, we're walking around the neighborhood again. And by this time, you know, it's probably 2.30 or 3 in the morning. And uh, we are walking by his house and he doesn't open up the window and see us. I think he finally had gone to sleep. Bless his poor old man's soul. I think he'd finally gone to sleep. Well, as we're walking by, car headlights pop up over the hill. And this whole time, we're all thinking, that he said he's gonna call the cops. And so we're like, oh, crap, like that, the cops are here. So in my mind, it's rational to like lay down in the ditch in this guy's yard and like take cover and not be seen by this car driving by. Well, I think that my two buddies who are with me are also gonna lay down in the ditch. Well, I lay down in the ditch and then I turn around to see my buddies and I see them sprinting away from me. And so they're leaving me behind dealing with this old guy because all of a sudden, you know, he's, he's there and this car headlights are coming. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be the one who gets in trouble with the police and it's gonna be this terrible. So, so I'm like, well, goodness, I'm in this frame of thought, scared. Uh, and so I get up and I'm sprinting away, like looking back over my shoulder at the car headlights and I run into a brick wall. I mean, literally like running straight into a wall and I knocks me backwards. I'm on my back in, in this grass looking up. And when I look up and see, sure enough, I had run into this guy's house right beside his window and I'm looking up and sure enough, light flicks on, sprints over the window, slams open the window and I'm sitting there staring this old guy straight in the face like, Oh, you, you got me. So I, I get up and I sprint away and run away. But in that moment of being so scared, I didn't have any kind of frame of thought or you know, frame of mind to think about what I was doing. I was just running away as fast as I could to get away from these lights that seemed like I thought they were chasing. It was just some random car. But I thought it was the police who were chasing me. So I was running away from this light. Well, Herod, in this moment, is so scared of what this Jesus can do, he decides rationally to kill all of the baby boys in this area, two years or younger. And so today I'm gonna talk about three ways that we think about Jesus. The first one is like King Herod, is it's a threat. We think that Jesus in our life can be a threat. We think this for several reasons. Maybe we really like doing something and we know that Jesus asks us to live a different way and so we don't wanna give up this thing. Maybe you've been brought up all of your life and you've struggled with your home situation or struggled with friends or struggled with bullying and anytime anyone says, hey, I care about you, I love you, there's a defense mechanism in your mind that you just wanna put up walls and not let that person get close to you. So when you hear about a Jesus loving you, there's like no way, so we put up walls as a threat in our life. The first way we can think about Jesus is a threat to be avoided, just like King Herod in this, in this story. The second way we think about Jesus can be just a dutiful visit, a dutiful visit. So that means like, hey, it's my duty, like maybe you go to church just on Christmas, like today is Christmas, e or Christmas service, maybe you go to church just on Easter, like oh hey, it's that time of the year again in the nation, in the wherever, it, I should go to church today. Maybe like this should be my one time. And just like that happens in this story, like the Magi visit him. They bring treasures. They're like, hey, this is awesome. The, the, you know, the Messiah has been born. Here's gold and frankincense and myrrh. Here's, here's all this amazing stuff because we believe the king has been born. Here's all this cool stuff. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pay my respects. I'm gonna do my dutiful visit, go visit him. And the Magi that's the last we hear about them. They, they go back a different way. The rest of scripture, we don't really hear about them again. And the final way, response number three to hearing about Jesus is a changed life. And in order to convey this, I wanna go back to last week's message uh, when we talked about the group that was with Jesus when he was born. 
because the shepherds in the nearby field, and this is coming out of Luke chapter two, so we're skipping a few gospels ahead. The shepherds in the, in the fields nearby heard about Jesus, and they went to him. And if you don't know who shepherds are, they were dirty, uh, they smelled bad in this time period. In fact, if they were over certain animals, the Jewish people literally wouldn't even talk to them because they considered them ceremonial, uh, just like, you know, spiritually unclean. Like they, they were so out there that the, like the, the priests, the, the people, the religious people were, were just so convinced, they were so dirty. Hey, they're, they're so dirty, I can't even talk to them. But you, you get this image of who is with Jesus when he's born. You have Mary and Joseph, teenage parents. You have animals around him. Like literally, like he, was, he was put into a manger. That's what the, the animals ate out of in this dirty straw. The, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the Messiah, the one who's gonna come and offer a way to get to know God to everybody, the Gentiles, everybody in the world is placed in a trough. Surrounded by animals, a teen mom and probably a teen dad, and the first people to visit him in the story recorded by Luke are shepherds, people many people wouldn't even associate with. And it's this great view of the gospel. It's this beautiful view. And the response number three is a changed life. When the shepherds come and see this baby, see the Messiah for the first time and realize, hey, this, this is a chance for the whole world to be free. This is a chance for everybody to know God. Because up to this point, the Jewish people thought, the Israelite people, the people of God thought that God could only be worshiped in a temple. In fact, at one point in the scripture, when Jesus grows up, when this baby grows up to do ministry, he's talking, and it's, it's known as the woman at the well, the story of the woman at the well. He's talking to this woman, and she's saying, well, hey, the Jewish people, like I was part of this culture, we were part, of, we know all of the rules and all the expectations, but they say that you can only worship him in this one place, but they don't even allow my people in this place to be worshiped. And Jesus tells her, well, hey, there's coming a day we don't have to go to the temple to get to know God, but all the ends of the world get to know God through the death and resurrection of the Messiah. And it's a beautiful picture in Luke chapter two of when Jesus comes into the world, he's gonna flip culture's expectations on their head. Because the reason Herod was scared at the beginning of this story, the reason Herod was terrified and killed all these babies is because the Jewish people believed the Messiah was gonna be a warrior, a guy with a sword, a guy who could lead armies, a guy who could take over the Roman Empire, but that's not what Jesus was. I mean, sure he could have with a snap of his fingers, they could have overthrown everything, but that's not what Jesus did. Jesus, instead of overthrowing the Roman Empire, he overthrew the kingdom of how people thought. He came for the broken. He came to be around the dirty. He came to be with the people that culture did not expect him to be with. When he was speaking to the woman at the well like I was talking to a second ago, Jewish men would, would have never gone near her. But Jesus comes near to the brokenhearted. He comes near to the dirty. He comes into a world, just like in Luke chapter two, comes into a world the way no one expects a king to do, surrounded by animals, dirty people, a teen mother and father. He comes into a world because he knows, hey, one day I'm gonna die for these people. One day he's gonna go to the cross and he's gonna beat death for these people to show them, you don't have to be the religious rulers to know me. You don't have to be the perfect people to know me. You don't have to have everything together to know me. What you need to do is just come to me. The shepherds, they do a very simple thing in this moment. They follow to where Jesus was born. And it says when, they're, when they walk away from him, they walk away glorifying and praising God. So here is my one question, my one main point for you today in life is where do you put Jesus? It's really easy to put him as a threat. Hey, if I trust this guy with everything, if I, if I trust God with everything in my life, what's gonna happen next? Where am I gonna go next? It's really easy to just view Christianity and God as a dutiful visit. I'm just gonna come on Christmas. I'm just gonna come on Easter. Every once in a while, I might slip something in an offering plate to make myself feel better. Or do you put him 
in your life and have a transformed life? Do you walk with him daily? Do you know the grace and the love that he has for you? Do you pray for people daily? Has your life been transformed? Where do you fall and what, what one of these responses resonates with you the best? Hey, I wanna encourage you. Man, if you don't know Christ, if you don't know that sacrifice, if you don't know that grace, man, man, talk to someone at your campus this morning or tonight, whenever you're viewing this. Tell your parents, hey, I, I wanna give this Jesus thing a shot. Have that conversation with somebody. It's not just for the perfect. It's not just for the people who seem like they have everything together, but Jesus comes into the world in a way to show culture, I'm gonna break your expectations. I'm coming for the broken. I'm coming for the dirty. I'm coming for those who need me. It's not, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but it's the sick. So if you'll pray with me really quick and then we'll wrap this up. God, thank you so much for this story that we get to see your love and your grace pour out to us in how Christ was born. It's so cool to picture that, that all of us who are brokenhearted, all of us who are so far away from you, that we can come back to you because of what one day this baby's gonna do. And going to the cross and dying for our sins so that we can have a relationship with you and we can believe in you. God, thank you that you're not just stuck in a temple somewhere, that we can praise you anywhere in life. If it's at a school, if it's at work, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, whatever it might be, God, that we can always come back to you. God, that you are the light of the world, that you are the purpose for this Christmas season, that we can see your glory in it, that you came into the world as a baby and died on a cross and beat the death so we can know you. God, thank you so much for loving us. God, thank you so much for the sacrifices you made for us. And God, I pray that we all desperately love you back, that we desperately seek you out every day. Thank you so much for loving us, God. We love you too. Amen. Hey, if, if you want to talk about that with somebody, if you want to say, what does it look like to have a relationship with Jesus, please talk to someone at your campus. We have Bibles. A great step to take is having a daily quiet time with God, reading through Scripture. We as a church are going through uh, the New Testament in January. If you want to hear more about that, please talk to somebody. If you need a Bible, we'll give you a Bible. If you wanna be baptized, we would love to talk about what baptism means with you. It's showing the, the public that you have faith in Christ. Hey, talk to somebody about that. Man, I'm so glad you guys spend time with us at, at every campus, at Abingdon, Marion, Bluefield, back in Bristol. Man, we're so glad you guys spend time with us. We care about building a relationship with you because we know the relationship we have with Christ. Thank y'all for coming tonight. We'll see you guys in a couple weeks. Ask your student pastor, ask somebody about Jesus tonight. Thank you, and we'll see you soon.